Okay, so Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 22. So you're going to have to pay attention today. You don't have all my cheat sheets, so I'll try to help make sure that you know where it is. And it's on page 727. 727. If you want to use one of the red Bibles in front of you, 727. I'll make it easy for you to find where we'll be reading from. And we're looking at today is why are we here? I think that's an important question. And I worked on my PowerPoint, so there would be question marks flying everywhere. Just imagine that. Yeah. That big question. Why are we here? Because uh, some of us are still asking that question. Why are we here? What's our purpose in life? And we want to answer that this morning. What is it we are called to do? If you go to businesses now, it's popular for them to have their mission statement, their purpose statement, and it's supposed to guide all that they do. It is supposed to be that theme for their business. I know in reading a book about Chick-fil-A, most of you know that's my favorite fast food, and the owner and founder was a very strong Christian. He's in heaven now. But he taught, or the, the theme was, that you were to serve every customer like you were serving the President of the United States. Now remember, he lived back when people actually respected our President. But that was his philosophy, is that you would serve like you were serving the President of the United States. And so if you go there, you will hear my pleasure. No matter what you ask them to do, and no matter how much they don't like doing what they're doing, they respond, my pleasure. Pleasure. And it just has an effect on the, the customers when you see somebody that has an attitude of wanting to help, wanting to serve you. Well, Jesus has given us that purpose, that mission statement that is to guide our life, that tells us why we're here. He's going to answer that question this morning. So let's start in verse 16. And that he, as Jesus, went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and unrolling it, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And they began saying, and he began saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Heavenly Father, help us to understand from this very short message what our purpose is, why we are here, as we understand why you sent Jesus. This world is hurting and broken. It needs us not only to understand our purpose, but to live our purpose. So motivate us as we start this new year with no energy, no power. May it not be symbolic of our lives, but maybe be just the opposite. Fill with the power of your Holy Spirit, warming the hearts of those that are cold from bitterness and heartache bringing light to those that are wandering in darkness that have lost all hope. May we make a difference in this world in 2023 because we're living our purpose. Amen. So what was Jesus in the custom of doing according to verse 16? Going to church. Jesus, the Son of God, the one who wrote the book... <laughs> was in the custom of going to church. And now you also have to remember, he was not very excited about what was being taught because they're focusing on legalism. But he still went to church. I remember being on staff in a church and I really did not enjoy the pastor's messages. 
I didn't agree with some of his theology. I thought he was boring. And I was complaining to God one day and God said, excuse me? If you're not worshiping me in church, is that the pastor's fault? You can worship me because I'm there. Amen. And an attitude adjustment. <laughs> and I started that next Sunday going and looking for God. And I found him as the scriptures were read. I found him in the music. I found him in other places than the message. Now that doesn't give me an excuse to not be prepared and do my best preaching. But the point is, even Jesus himself found purpose in going to church. It was his custom to go and to worship God. He went to his hometown where he had been brought up. And he goes to church, as is his custom. And it said he stood to read the scriptures. This is also a custom. Now, I don't think if you sit down to read the Bible that you're sinning or God is going to disdain. It's all about an attitude of a heart. But it's that, that sign of respect. When I was growing up, I was taught that when a woman walked in the room, you stood up as a sign of respect. Now, women will look at you as you're treating me different, and I get all these negative remarks. I'm no different. But it was a sign of respect that I was taught. And so we stand, if you notice, when we read from the Bible, when we read that verse together. But if you'll notice, we're not consistent because then you don't stand when I'm reading these. So it's not a legalism, but in the Jewish culture, it was a legalism, but its purpose was to show respect for God's word. So Jesus, as we see, he's fitting into these, this culture. We think of him as being anti-culture, but he only went against the culture that went against God. With me on that? He obeyed the culture of the area where he was born. There's nothing wrong with culture. Our missionaries used to go into a country and they would try to change the people to become like Americans or like Europeans. This is not God. God only wants to change a heart, not our culture. So it says that he was given the scroll. Now, we don't know if Jesus asked specifically for Isaiah. The custom was that the attendant picked the verses that would be read that day. First, you would read from the Torah, and usually that was in order, and then you would read from one of the prophets, and the attendant usually got to pick. So we don't know if Jesus just took what was given him or not, but he unrolls the scroll. He stands and he reads before the people from Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. Now, what's important about this is that text the Jewish scholars would have known was talking about the Messiah. Okay, so with me on that? This would have been a verse they would have known that was a prophecy saying there's going to be a Messiah coming that's going to deliver his people. And here's what he's going to do. So they would have been fine with that. He's reading it. They would have known instantly that it was a prophecy in the future about a coming Messiah. But what did Jesus say? It says, when he finishes, he says, it's me. But he reads, and it says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. What happened to Jesus at his baptism? Do you remember? The dove came down and landed on his head. Symbolic of that Holy Spirit coming down. He was anointed by God. And then it says, God spoke from heaven and said, this is my son. So he is anointed by the Holy Spirit. This was one of the things the Jews believed about the Messiah. He would be anointed. So when he's reading this, it's very clear to them, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. He's talking about the Messiah. And it says, because he's appointed me to preach good news to the poor. Some of the commentaries said this was poor spiritually. I don't know. I think it could be both. Because we know that people who are wealthy sometimes can be arrogant. We know in this church we've experienced that differently of people who God is blessed, who have a humble spirit and a loving heart. But the Bible tells us that if you don't have to depend on anybody but yourself, it's kind of difficult to learn to depend on God. So it's difficult for the wealthy to accept Christ. Not impossible, but difficult because they don't recognize they have a need. But I think this is probably both. But Jesus, as we know, he preached to everyone. 
He preached to everyone that good news of salvation, of the gift of love of Jesus Christ. And then it says, proclaim freedom to the prisoners. This could be literally, because he did preach to prisoners, but I'm thinking again more spiritually here, because the King James would translate this to heal the brokenhearted. It's those that are prisoners in their heart. How can we be a prisoner? We're a prisoner to bitterness. <clears throat> the wrong was wrong that happened to us. If we were abused, if we were neglected, whatever, that was wrong. It's sinful and God hated that. But if we hang on to that bitterness, it imprisons our heart from experiencing love. That bitterness, the Bible says, gives a foothold for Satan himself. That bitterness consumes us and it robs us from joy. And really, we are giving more power to that person who abused us because we're allowing them to continue. Even if they're dead, we're allowing them to continue to rob life from us. And Jesus is one who comes and says, I'm going to give you freedom. We have a class we do at this church called Freedom in Christ. It's a wonderful class. It helps us to experience that freedom of letting go of that bitterness, letting go of that anger, letting go of those sinful habits, whatever it may be that has us in bondage. Jesus is that I'm here to set you free. See, Satan has worked through the world to have us believe that God is restrictive. He's limiting because he's that God of you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. But he's a God that said, I want to set you free. Remember, Satan is the deceiver. So stop and question yourself if you've been hearing that and you believe that, that God is about all these rules of can'ts. His rules of can'ts are so that you are free to have safety, to have freedom in life, to know his abundant joy. So he said, I'm here to proclaim freedom to the captive. The people that are in bondage to sin, that don't even know it, I'm here to tell you, I can make you free. Then it says, heal the blind. Well, we know he literally did that. He was the first and only one in history that gave sight to people who were really blind. We just talked about that recently, if you remember, John 9. But again, I think it's also spiritually. The Jewish people were blinded, but so are we. I'm not picking on the Jewish people. They are just the symbol of what most of us are like. We're blinded to that truth. We're listening to our own wisdom or the wisdom of people because it makes sense. And I'll be the first to tell you, I don't understand everything about God, but I know his character. I know his character full well. And his character is one of mercy and love and grace and praise God, patience. He has yet to give up on me. And I'm thankful for that. So I don't understand why he does things he does, but I know his heart and I trust that heart. But so many of us are still blind because the philosophy and the teaching of this world goes against God and it kind of fits our understanding. Of course it does because we made it up as people. So we understand that, right? And God has things that just don't make sense. The last shall be first and the first last. That just doesn't make sense to my human mind. I want to be first. I want to be the best. I want to be the top. And God's saying I need to be a servant if I want to be on the top. That just doesn't make sense. But I can tell you I've experienced that. That God is telling us the truth. He's counter-cultural in some ways. But when I know him and I trust his heart, I'm willing to go countercultural and not worry what others are going to think about me. Then it says, release to the oppressed. We don't have to look very far. Sacramento, my friends, is the top sexual trafficking city in our nation. We're talking 10 miles from us. And we don't hear about that on the news, do we? We don't know that that's what's happening. Just 10 miles from us, just over the river. And they focus, their number one uh, priority are on foster kids because they're longing for somebody to love them, to include them, to welcome them. And so they're easily deceived into this trap. 
and then they're sold into slavery. We think and we look back on our history, and I will agree, it's horrible that we had slavery in this country. But we still do, my friends. And where is our Martin Luther Kings for these kids? Where are our people that are standing up? It needs to be the church. It needs to be the church. But we're quiet. Our mission, my friends, is not necessarily political, but is to go into battle for these children that are being oppressed and abused right in our own backyard, right here close to our church family. That is part of our purpose, is to help those that are oppressed. And then it says, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor in verse 19. This is a reference to the year of Jubilee. Now, you may not know your Israel history for this, but every 49 years or on the 50th year, it was a declared a year of Jubilee. And what does that mean? It means all of your debts were forgiven. Yay! Yay! Wouldn't that be wonderful if we practiced that now, you know? And it would mean that if you had to sell your property to pay off your debt, you got your property back at the end on that 50th year. Everything that had been yours in the past was given to you again for a new start, a clean slate. You would owe nothing and you would have everything again. So what Jesus is here is saying is, Guess what, my friends? I don't care how much you've goofed in the past. I don't care how much debt you may owe me. I don't care what you have done in the past. I'm here to proclaim to you the year of the Lord's favor. You get to start over. We often talk about that. This new year is a do-over. <laughs> but guess what? I tried that, and my credit card companies don't say I get a clean slate. <laughs> All of the debt from... 2022 is moving over to 2023. Yeah? yeah? But with Jesus Christ, I get a clean slate. Amen. I get to start again. And the beauty with him is, I get to do that every morning, as Juan was talking about. Now, that doesn't mean I just don't care what I do, and I just live with no respect of my God. Because I don't want to break his heart. I love him. But if I do make a mistake, he says, my relationship with you is more important than fairness. I'm willing to suffer to be in a relationship with you. I'll accept the pain of your disobedience because I want to be in relationship with you. That's what he's here to proclaim. I don't know about you, but that's good news to me. That's something to get excited about. And so in 2023, I need to be proclaiming to this world that is deteriorating, this world that thinks when life is bad, I just pull out a gun and shoot the people that hurt me and shoot myself to end it. And there's a better way. There's a way to healing and freedom of all that pain in your heart. And it can bring you to that place of being forgiven and loved and accepted and filled with joy. That's so much better than a gun. So much better than ending your life or the life of others. And we have the answer. So instead of sitting back in our living room and complaining about the deterioration of our world, we as a church need to take responsibility and say, oh yeah, I'm not going to go with a, a hold up a sign that condemns the world. That doesn't help. But I'm going to go to that friend who's hurting. Put my arm around him. Let them know they're loved. Let them know I'm here to listen. Dee and I were talking before church got started <laughs> and laughing. And yeah, I can't judge you. And she was sharing some of her family struggles and I was sharing some of my family struggles. And that's the beauty of it. We all have dirt. We all have skeletons in our closet. But in this church, the closet doors are open. Because we don't fear any judgment. Because we know no one here is perfect. But I'm loved and accepted. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. This is that favorable year of the Lord that we as a church need to be letting the hurting people around us know you are loved and accepted. There's somebody that cares about your struggles. 
that's going to walk with you through life. John the Baptist's disciples came to Jesus and said, John is in prison, but he wants to know, who are you? And look at Luke 7.22. You can read these later at home. They're written there on, on your listening guide. But he says, and Jesus answered them and said, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached for them. So basically, Jesus is saying, go and tell them what you've seen and heard. And it's what I'm telling you right here that I was sent to do. I'm doing what God has sent me to do. That's the proof that I'm the Messiah. James 1.27, look how this relates to us. Pure and undefiled religion and the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. That, he says, is pure and undefiled religion. This is what God desires. And those of you who remember prior to three years ago, I kept adopting and fostering orphans, and I told God I was waiting for my widow. Thank you for a few of you that are paying attention. And God blessed me. So I get to have pure and undefiled religion now taking care of orphans and a wonderful wife. It wasn't a widow, but. But this is what God says I desire. It's not that you can only minister to orphans and widows, but it's symbolic of those people who are oppressed that need help. Children had no rights in this day. They could be bought and sold just like a cow. There was no one that defended them if they were being abused for not working hard enough for their family. If the family was poor and, and dad, maybe alcoholism got them in debt, there was nothing to say he couldn't sell his kids to earn more money. Sell them into slavery. They had no rights, no one to defend them. And so if they had no parents, there were no orphanages to welcome them. And there were no such thing as foster parents to welcome them in the home. Many of them had to go to begging or worse. Widows. Maybe they were just fine and wealthy while their husband was alive, but women had no rights either, ladies. There weren't many jobs that would pay for them other than that one that's pretty bad and shameful. And sometimes their parents would not accept them back because they would be a financial burden to them. There was no love, no respect. These two people were people that were often forgotten about. Who would that be today in our society? Well, yeah, the obvious I've already talked about would be our foster kids, especially when they become teens. So many people are afraid of teenagers, even if they're their own biological teenagers. This is a group of kids that just long to be loved. Just wanting somebody to say, you're important enough to me to, to stick with you. I'm not just going to send some money and buy you Christmas gifts. I'm going to welcome you into my home. You're going to become a part of my family. Most of you remember, because I talked about how it penetrated my heart, when I adopted Otavio, and he's signing his name on the paper, and he wrote, Otavio Augusto Hardy. And he looked up a big sign and says, I have a last name. <laughs> he had grown up with no family name ever. And I never thought about the importance of that, but just think about your last name. Whether you like your parents or not, it means you belong. You have a family you belong to. He had never had even a last name to think about having belonged to a family. But my friends, we also have those people who have escaped as refugees and have come here to this country. Many who receive an unwelcome. They don't want to leave their home, their culture, their land, their businesses, their family. Many of them had no choice to move to America. And we just kind of ignore them. We think because their English isn't perfect that they must be dumb. My friends, they probably speak five languages, so maybe it's not perfect, but they're not dumb. 
There are people who need to be welcomed in love because they're fearful. They're scared. They don't know our culture. They don't know our language. Have you ever thought about how difficult it would be just to go and apply for a driver's license if you don't know the language, you don't know the rules? Oh, I was supposed to make an appointment online. You can't see me. Oh, I needed to bring these papers. Any of you ever tried to work with the government in another country and try to figure out the policies and how-tos? What if we reached out as a church and said, I'm going to go with you to the DMV. I'm going to go hang with you at the DMV. I don't care if it's a two-hour wait, because you're worth it. My friends, I could go on to that list of the oppressed. We are to be proclaiming the year of the Lord to them. This church should be the place where people know I'm welcomed and loved. The rest of society may look at me and not understand my value, but this church, they get me. They see the image of God in me and know that I have great worth. They welcome me. They help me find freedom. That's pure religion. It's not coming and memorizing verses. It's not coming and being pharisaical in my behavior that I'm better than others. It's finding people who need to be set free and loving on them to freedom. Amen. What was Jesus' sermon? You're probably wishing I could have learned from him because it was very short. So he rolled back up the scroll, gave it to the attendant, who would have taken it and put it back in the ark for protection. And everybody's eyes were fixed on him. His popularity, his fame had been heard throughout the line. And now he's back home. And they're ready to listen to him. And he says in verse 21, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Basically what Jesus is saying is, I'm the Messiah. It says he sat down. And if you could just imagine, I have a picture I was going to show you of me sitting in the Moses seat. The, the synagogue was different. So you would stand here to read the scripture, but back by the entrance door would be a stone seat. And you had been sitting on, on stone along this wall. Maybe a couple of layers, depending on how big. So then you would just turn your head and the pastor would sit down to preach. So that means he could really preach for a long time. <laughs> but Jesus kept his short, and he says, Today, this scripture has been said. I'm the Messiah, is what he said. That was his short sermon. I'm the Messiah. The impact of his message on us is that we need to know that if we really love Jesus, we're going to take up his mission, his mission statement, his purpose his passion for setting the captive free. We're not going to just wait for somebody to show up at church and love on them. We're going to be looking in the community. What can I do? What can I do to, to notice people that are in captivity? You ever just thought simply as, as you go to the restaurant today, if you can find one with electricity, I'm hearing South Davis, right? I think you still have electricity there. So we're all going to South Davis. As you go to a restaurant, just notice the server. Are they a little downcast today? Are they making mistakes? Instead of complaining and thinking you should have perfect service, have you ever thought about serving them? How are you doing? Any way I can pray for you? Just want to remind you that even when you're having a difficult day, there's people who understand and care. Maybe give them a card for the church. Just if you ever need prayer, call us, email us, can you imagine the difference that would make? I did that one, one time at a restaurant in Woodland. And about three months later, I find myself at that same restaurant. And I don't eat a lot in Woodland and don't know why, but I was back to the same restaurant. And the server comes running up to me and gives me a big hug. And she says, thank you for praying for me. And I will confess, I didn't remember her, didn't remember the prayer. But I didn't seriously pray for her that day. I prayed for her at the table. And prayed for her for a few days after until this old mind kind of kind of forgot with new prayer requests. But she hugs me and says, God answered that prayer. And she was so excited. And the beauty was, it wasn't about me, it was that she recognized God had answered her prayer. 
She experienced the love of God during a difficult time and a depressing time in her life. All because I just simply ask, is there any way I could pray for you today? And as a tear came down her cheek, she shared with me her need. And I stopped right then and prayed with her. That was all I did. Nothing miraculous, nothing that cost me anything, nothing that was embarrassing. I simply just prayed with her one time. And it brought hope and healing to her life. My friends, when Jesus said, I came as a Messiah to set the captive free, he didn't stop when he went to heaven. He gave us that responsibility. Look at Luke 9, 2 that we read earlier. And Jesus sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing. I think we focus on that physical healing. And yes, God can use us to perform physical healing. But again, his focus, his priority is on that spiritual healing. So what would it look like if our church was living out this purpose for why we are here? We're not here to be blessed with a life of ease. We're not here to have everything go right for us. We're here to be a blessing to others, to set the captive free. And this world is filled with broken, hurting, captive souls. You don't believe me? Go home, well, wait till you get electricity. Turn on the TV and watch the news. No more is it did anybody get shot today? It's how many and where? None of those people who go in and kill their co-workers or, or go in and just randomly kill somebody say, oh, it's having the best of life. God would bless me. I have wonderful family life. I've got a good job and, and I'm just blessed, but I just felt a need to kill somebody. No, these people are hurting. They're aching inside. So instead of passing more laws for gun control, we need to pass more of the Spirit to heal hearts. Because my friends, we can help, and I don't want to get political on the gun laws, sorry I even brought that up, but we can pass all the laws we want to and people are still going to find a way to kill people until we change their hearts with the love of Jesus Christ. That's what makes the difference. That's what makes the change. There's one man I'm visiting that's in prison. I haven't asked him why. But he's in there for a long time. So my guess is he did something really bad by society's eyes. But in my visits over these last two years, this young man has accepted the Lord as his Savior. And I've watched a total change in his attitude. A willingness to accept the punishment and not complain. A willingness to want to share with prisoners. An attitude of hope. And he's facing many years in prison. Because he may be behind bars, but his heart was finally set free. His situation hasn't changed, but the condition of his heart has. Because he found Jesus. And no bars, no prison can stop you from knowing the joy of being loved and accepted. So what's this church going to do in this new year? Are we going to recognize why we're here? Are we going to start reaching out? Just looking around, even in this church family. Thursday at the senior adult luncheon, I simply ask, what do you want to see? Or what would you like to do in 2023? I think it would just be a fun, easy question. And almost everybody was in tears, sharing of the heartache, the brokenness in their families, and their desire to see reconciliation, desire to see healing. I think it helped for us all to know we're in the same situation and to know that people listen and care about that situation. My friends, this church is filled with people that are hurting still. And we have the answer. Simply by not fixing the problem, but by sharing the problem.
by hugging. I think COVID, one of the worst things it did was to stop that physical touch, that, that hug, that comfort that we need. God has given us the reason we're here. So here's my question for 2023. Are we going to live it? Are we going to live it and reach out and set the captive free for them to know and experience love and acceptance and joy? Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of being your servant. Thank you for letting us be involved in your ministry of setting the captive free, of bringing your love to people who are hurting and watching their hearts be healed, watching their hearts be comforted and strengthened and filled with love and joy, watching that transformation happen. Help us to see there is no more exciting thing to be involved in than in the ministry of setting the captive free of freeing the oppressed, of giving sight to those that are blind and have been deceived by Satan and don't know who it is that is desiring to love them. Heavenly Father, help us not out of guilt, not out of necessity or responsibility, but out of a joy and a love for you and knowing what we've experienced ourselves. Help us to be a church that practices true religion by setting the captive free. Amen. God is at work, and that's the beautiful thing that in, excites me so much, is I know it's not dependent upon my ability, but just my willingness to allow the Holy Spirit to use me, that he's speaking to your heart. If you do not know Christ as your Savior, if you do not know this love, this acceptance, this freedom... We want to invite you as we stand and sing just to come to the front. And I'll tell you exactly what we will do. I will pair you up with somebody. They'll take you into a room and they're going to shine a light in your eyes. They're going to drip water on your head. They're going to shoot you up with some drugs that will make you. They're going to take you into a room and they're going to introduce you to a God who loves you. Who desires to welcome you into his family. All they will do is do the introductions. Then, as they help you meet him, you can decide, do I want to welcome this God of love into my heart? Or do I want to continue struggling and trying to make this life work in my own power? But don't leave here without meeting him, the God that loves you. If you already know him, but you're struggling, you've got some of that heart of him, you just want uh, God with some flesh on today, then come and let us pray with you. Let us walk with you, whatever that struggle is, and help you to know you're not alone. To allow us to be a part of that ministry of God to your heart. So let's stand and sing. And you come forward as you have that need of prayer, please. We're going to sing together, Pass me not, O gentle Savior.